Okay, pals. Uh, so the whole overview is just to give you a, a more proficiency, more a better proficiency at doing pals, right? How to treat a critically ill uh, pediatric patient, how to recognize and mitigate certain uh, ECGs. Uh, we're going to go over that yeah. again like we did in ACLS class, just real quick, nothing crazy. The six, six steps needed to evaluate and recognize an ECG. Uh, AHA for PALS wants you to recognize and, if needed, mitigate 14 different rhythms. We're going to go over those. Uh, determining the stable, to, from the un, stable from the unstable patient and how to treat them accordingly. And then how to assess the pediatric patient, right, because they can't talk to us. With the advent of the I.O., we no longer have to worry about stuff like scalp cannulation, starting an IV, and it's very, very difficult for babies. Um, I will go over umbilical cannulation. When we get to the end, I'll show you tiny, tiny baby. Imagine your, your baby when she was born brand new. Brand new, a minute old. Did you want to stick a needle this big in their leg? I don't. Because if you're overzealous and excited, you could cause lifelong damage to that bone, right? Now you're held liable. Remember, babies' bones aren't this hard when they're born. They're malleable, soft, right? So you can do damage, especially if you've got adrenaline going. So we're gonna do we're gonna go over umbilical cord cannulation. It's easy, 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 right? Two arteries, one vein, and done. <clears throat> and then defibrillation, Laura's gonna go over defibrillation cardioversion. That's weight-based, right? Designed for healthcare providers who either direct or participate in management of respiratory or cardiovascular emergencies, nurses, doctors, us. Basically used to enhance the recognition and intervention of respiratory cardiac arrest. Right, that's all that's for. And just uh, the course goal is to make you more comfortable with uh, treating a, pa a pediatric patient who's in uh, respiratory arrest, cardiac arrest, and shock. And using the team dynamics. That's a big one, right? Uh, I got a video at the end that shows the importance of just CPR. AHA is harping now on just good CPR, good compressions. Even if you don't breathe for the patient, they've done studies to where there's enough oxygen uh, saturation in the blood to where if you just compress on that chest good enough, you'll bring someone back. And I have a video that shows just that. They do some weird stuff at the beginning, but pediatric kids are very, very resilient right they come back from things that uh, grown people normally don't so don't give up don't give up right again team dynamics um i've ran a couple pediatric arrests anybody run a pediatric arrest in here right first thing you do i do bust out the Braswell tape measure the baby and it could be an emt or a paramedic measure it now your job is, and only your job, is to read all that information that's on that Braslow tape, right? It doesn't have to be a paramedic, it could be an EMT. EMTs can read. You guys have reading comprehension, at least at a high school level, right? Maybe, okay, right? So that's the first thing you do. Don't get, don't get caught up on measuring the baby. Okay, they're red. Okay, now what do I need? No, hey, they're red. What's size ET tube? What's my first medication? Right? What's my second dose medication? What size NG tube do I need? Now with the uh, injectors that we have that we put over the medication, we don't have to even do math anymore. It's super, super easy, and Laura's going to go over that, right? Because we've only kind of touched on it on an in-service, but we'll go over that again today. <clears throat> Early interventions is super easy, uh, super important, right? Respiratory distress and failure, know the difference. Uh, me and Dan ran a call a couple years ago, covered why I'm sure to tell you guys a story. Uh, baby wasn't breathing. We went in, just started bagging the baby a couple times. Baby started moving and then crying. Thank God, right? Crisis averted, right? So if you just breathe for them, they're very, very resilient. And then tr know the difference between stable and unstable. When to use medicine? and Edison medicine, right? My little saying, Edison medicine, electricity. <clears throat> uh, I forgot to go over this right here. So compensated and decompensated, right? The 25% rule. Babies can lose up to 25% of their total blood volume or fluid before you start to see any signs of decompensation. 
us, if we start to lose 10 to 15 of our blood volume, pale, cool, diaphoretic, disoriented, signs of shock, right? Babies could maintain, maintain, maintain up to 25% of their blood loss and then straight down. Not good. Oh, shit. Now you're behind the eight ball, right? Not good. So just be aware of that. <clears throat> so how do we treat, recognize, cardiac arrest, brady dysrhythmias, and tachy dysrhythmias? I will tell you your first note you should write down. A pediatric patient who is in a bradycardic rhythm is an impending sign of cardiac arrest. A pediatric patient who is in a bradycardic rhythm is in an impending sign of cardiac arrest. And what normally causes a child to go into brady? That's a test question. Hypoxia. Hypoxia, right? Okay. Respiratory. Anything because kids don't have a lifelong uh, uh, bad eating habits, right? They don't have arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis. They don't have heart attacks at two years old, right? It's respiratory with them. So if we could fix that, the heart will follow. And then at the end, be able to combine the knowledge that Laura is going to teach you with actually putting into a whole practical Hello. scenario when we do the mega codes. They're not going to be crazy, nice and easy, okay? You guys know my mega codes. Yeah, that's fine. So starting with the rhythms that we have to recognize and if needed, mitigate, starting with the normal ones, right? The easy one. Never ET, all those blocks. All that stuff, right? Yeah. Keep going on. Anybody ever seen torsades in the field? Hospital. Yes, 42 right? had a strip not too long ago. That was yeah. another one, apparently. Yeah, 25 years, I've never seen it. It's a, mm. It exists, I guess, supposedly. I've never seen it, right? See and then 60 cycle interference. What is 60 cycle interference? 60 cycle artifact. Is there, it's a... Uh, uh, the ECG monitor getting outside interference and not getting a good tracing on the person. So uh, usually from electricity, right? So if you have a, long, a strong electrical uh, uh, field close to or around the monitor, it'll cause like a weird, uh, uh, like, you know, like the UPC code. When you scan it, it'll almost look like that on the monitor, right? A 60-cycle interference or 60-cycle artifact. <clears throat> you guys ever heard of it? No? Oh. All right. So the, the, <laughs> the six steps to rhythm recognition, right? Every time you find an EKG rhythm, you should do a systematic approach. And I, to this day, still do this. If you follow these six steps and not jump around, you'll be able to know what rhythm you're looking at. You have to have to know a couple things, right? You have to commit to memory that the QRS complex is 0.04 to 0.12 seconds, and the PRI is 0.12 to 0.20. You have to know those two, right? Have to, because if not, you don't know, right? Now, what's the intrinsic rate of the SA node, the rate of the SA node? Six to 100. Six to 100. I, I, intrinsic, it's a fancy word for the normal rate. The normal rate, right? So the intrinsic rate of the SA node is 60 to 100, right? Normal heart rate. Next one that takes over, 40 to 60. And the next one, 20, right, 20 to 40, right? So that's another one we have to know when we figure out what rate we're looking at, right? And then the last one, the regularity. Do the, P, do the R to R's march out and do the P waves march out, right? QRS present, the conduction ratio, is there one P wave for every QRS, and is there a QRS for every P wave? That's, that's we have to know the conduction ratio. Uh, what's the PRI from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the R wave? How long is it, right? I have a, uh, a rhythm that has P waves upright, normal in appearance. The QRS is 0 0.05 seconds. There's a one-to-one -one conduction ratio. The PRI is 0.27 or 0.30 at a rate of 70, and that is regular. What rhythm am I looking at? Who said it? A first-degree heart block, right? You guys are doctors. You guys know it, right? So the first thing we look at, right, is that extended PRI right off the bat, just first-degree heart block. Some of you in this room might have it. It's not a big deal. We don't need to treat it unless the patient is showing signs. Diaz, all right. So the first rhythm we look at, <laughs> wow, shots fired already. Damn, every class. <laughs> all right, so the first rhythm we look at, right, we look at our six steps for identifying the rhythm, 
and we have P waves. We look at P waves, upright and normal. Yep, the QRS, it's within that normal time range, right? They're nice and narrow. Conduction ratio, I have one P wave to every QRS and one QRS to every P wave, right? The PRI looks normal, right? Within no more than 0 0.20 seconds. The rate is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Rate is 70, right? Our six second strip method. If we were to do our triplets method of counting, that'd be uh, 300, 150, 100, 75, a little bit less than 70. So it comes out to about the same, right? And if I were to march out those R to R's and the P waves, they would be regular. What rhythm is this? No sinus. You guys are awesome. Now, first thing we look at, P waves present? No. No, no P waves. QRS with a normal time range, conduction ratio, zero to one. Rate, one, two, three, four, 40, at a rate of 40. And if I were to march out those R waves, they would march out normally, right? Paramedic students newly graduated, what rhythm am I looking at? Absent P waves at a rate of 40, huh? Junctional, what is the rate of the uh, junctional node? You guys just said it earlier. 40 to 60, so this is within that range, right? What would be another name for this rhythm? Starts with an I. It, no, no, idio, no. Idio junk. Idiojunctional. Idiojunctional. Idio just means within its normal range or within normalcy. Idiopathic, normal, uh, normal status, right? <laughs> Idiojunctional. Now, if this was at a rate of 80, same thing, just a rate of 80, now what would we call it? An accelerated junctional, right? A rate of 20, what would we call this? Not good. <laughs> Junctional. Junctional bradycardia, right? Super simple. You guys are overthinking it. You guys know it. You guys are awesome, right? So now we look at our other rhythm, right? P Don't waves present. Take you down. Uh, there's one there, there, maybe hiding there, right? Weird. The QRS, yes, it's within normal range. Conduction ratio, we have a variable conduction ratio, right? The PRI, when it's present, it varies, right? The rate, uh, variable maybe, right? Um, and is it regular? No. no. Any uh, hints on what this might be? <laughs> Third degree block. That's so cute. Third degree block, you guys are awesome, right? You guys are awesome. Uh, treatment of choice. Treatment of choice? What? Oxygen first, then? Well, we can't give medicine to a third degree heart block. It's a contraindication. Pace. Pace. Edison, Edison <laughs> medicine, except for third degree. Yeah. For third degree? <laughs> yeah, because it doesn't work, it right? Doesn't work, the it won't the work. pathways are disconnected and atropine no longer works, right? You can give atropine, but it's not going to work. I'm telling you, third degree heart block, that means there's a total disassociation between the SAAV and the, what, what and the you, ventricular are you nodes. Right? What are you looking at? Yeah, I think it's, yeah, don't go by bradycardia. All right, so rhythm, P waves, maybe, oh, I don't know, I can't really see. QRS, yeah, within the normal time limit. Conduction Does ratio, not sure. PRI, I can't tell. Rate, super you fast. You right? Uh, rate about 300, just under 300. And is it regular? Yes. What would we call this rhythm? Huh? SVT. What? SVT, right? So now you walk into the room, baby looks at you, positive visual tracking, right? Uh, good affect. Everybody in this room right now is called, uh, has what it's called positive affect. You guys are acting normally to the environment you're in. If I were all of a sudden just go up tundid, I would have a negative affect. After right? lunch. You guys need to know that for when you're assessing kids. So good visual tracking, good positive affect. When you go to grab the baby, baby starts to cry, separation anxiety. The three major things we look at when we're assessing a baby, right? So the baby has all those three things in this rhythm here. Stable or unstable? 
Stable. Treatment of choice? Good. Awesome. Now, same baby, you walk in the room, he's laying his head on mom's chest, doesn't look at you. When you go to get the baby or you rub his cheek, right, that's called a, a, a cheek reflex. When you rub their cheek, they should look in that direction. No moral reflex. Moral reflex is when you put your finger on their hand, they grab. Grab reflex, moral reflex. Good word. And when you go to grab the baby, baby doesn't even cry. Stable or unstable? Unstable. unstable. Treatment of choice? Edison medicine. Yes. There you go. Taking it the extra mile there, fight. Oh, man, I love it. All right. Love these guys. So when we assess the pediatric patient, it's slightly different from assessing an adult, right? We first have to evaluate the patient, find out what's going on, and look at the big three or the big four things for the pediatric, right? Positive affect, visual tracking, separation anxiety, and good range of motion, right? We get the baby and make sure that the wrists, elbows, shoulders move, hips, knees, everything. Mom calls and says, baby's been crying uncontrollably. I don't know what to do. I've been feeding him, changing diapers. Everything's normal, right? What happens a lot with kids, don't be such a baby, they get hair wrapped around their fingers or toes or strings from their onesies, and it's painful to them. And oftentimes, mom misses that because they don't look for it. And it's super common. It happens a lot, happens a lot, right? So those are the big four things to look for when assessing a baby, right? Visual tracking, separation anxiety, positive or negative affect, and good range of motion, paying attention to the fingers and toes, right? Their work of breathing, do they sound normal? Are they uh, 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 grunting, right? Nasal flaring, retractions, are they uh, gasping? That's, those are all bad things, right? And what do they look like? Are they centrally cyanotic or do they have acrocyanosis? Fancy word for saying pink in the middle, blue in the extremities. Acrocyanosis, right? Uh, babies have a much harder time at thermal regulation than adults do, so they react very, very differently to a cold environment, right? Us in here, it's about 70 degrees. If I were to do a cap refill, would you expect it to be higher or lower? higher because it's colder our capillaries constrict when it's colder it's a byproduct of the cold right so if i'm doing it on a baby in a cold environment because their thermal regulation is crap i'm going to expect a longer cap refill right so we go to a different site remember that fancy word i use the thenar prominence right there thenar prominence or the chest right if it's a colder environment two places we look for so when you walk into the door, right, the first thing you look for, well, the first thing you want to hear for is a crying baby, right? You get dispatched to a call, possible respiratory cardiac arrest on a three-year-old. You walk in the door and you hear a crying baby. Oh, thank God, right? Pucker factor decreased. Thank God, all right? I can do this. I can do it from here, right? <laughs> now, you don't hear a baby crying and you hear everybody going crazy. It's going to happen. My first pediatric arrest was a SIDS baby. Everybody was just chaotic, rightly so. Right, so, right? So we look at those things. If the baby looks at you, right, there's a stranger coming into their house, visual tracking, right? You look at, wave a finger or a teddy bear or something in front of their eyes, cheek reflex, moral reflex, right? Separation anxiety. Those are the things we look for, right? And then uh, the uh, uh, range of motion on the extremities and pay close attention to your. Uh, toes. Every pediatric report narrative you write should, should, should include these four things. Walked into the home of a three-year-old baby. Baby had positive affect, positive visual tracking, separation anxiety, and good range of motion to the extremities. Should include those four things. On all my pediatric call, I still write that. I still write that because if this goes somewhere else, the expert witness for the lawyer will read that and go, damn, this guy knows what's going on. This guy knows what to look for, right? So work of breathing. Strider is upper or lower airway? Upper. Upper. You might see that somewhere. You're going to see that a lot. You might see that somewhere. Strider is? Upper. Upper. Grunting right? is bad. Wheezing lower, 
right? Low airway, and then grunting. The video I have on the PALS uh, DVD will show a baby grunting, right? Totally abundant, negative affect, right? Nasal flaring, retractions, right? Sternocleidomastoid retractions, uh, intercostal retractions, <laughs> gasping, and we don't want to see a baby with agonal resps, right? But it's easy to fix, easy to fix. Supplemental oxygen, BVM, bagging a few times. My covered wagon story, right? They came right back. They came right back. Very resilient. What's their skin look like? Cyanotic, acrocyanotic, central cyanosis, fancy stuff, right? All right, so when we assess the pediatric patient, we have to see what's going on with the nervous system, right? And taking it back to EMT school, we know that the central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system consists of all this other stuff, right? Somatic, autonomic, think of autonomic as automatic, right? Digestion, breathing, heart rate. I, I can control my breathing, but at night when I'm sleeping, the autonomic uh, nervous system takes place, right? Somatic, sensory, all that stuff, right? So where I want to live is right in here, right? The sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system because depending on what level of distress the baby is in, they're more likely to be right here. So, talking about the sympathetic nervous system first, right? The feed and breed, the rest and feed uh, nervous system, right? Primary chemical is acetylcholine, right? It's stored in, uh, at the end of nerve endings and little vessels, and when the brain says release, it releases them in the synaptic cleft, and we do all that, right? One of the chemicals released, anybody ever do NO explode when they work out, the pre-workout? NO explode, get your jack, bro. What did it do? Vasodilated. We have nitric okay. oxide in our muscles, and when acetylcholine is released, we have vasodilation. So what's going to happen to our blood pressure? Decrease, low blood pressure, right? And then the primary nerve that's affected from the brain is the 10th cranial nerve or the vagus nerve, right? Not Las Vegas, bro, let's party. The vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is responsible for increasing heart rate, but when acetylcholine is released, it does the opposite, right? If I stimulate the vagus nerve, what's going to happen to my heart rate? Increase. If I stimulate the vagus nerve, if I stimulate, it's going to increase, right? What vagolytic anti-parasympathetic medication do we have? Vagolytic means uh, to, to lysis is to kill, a vagolytic to kill the vagus action. What vagolytic anti-parasympathetic medication do we have in our drug box? Atropine. Atropine. Preemptively, when we go to intubate a pediatric patient, AHA PAL says have the atropine at, uh, at the ready to give. Why? How? Why? The blade, the blade of the laryngoscope, because the vagus nerve runs alongside the esophagus and the trachea, when you go to intubate the baby, you stimulate the vagus nerve, heart rate increases, right? We want to give atropine. Oh, no, you're right. Yes. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah, we want to give atropine, right? <laughs> yes. Corey's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so we give atropine, right? Because we just stimulated that vagus nerve. All right. So now, when a baby is stressed, think of the stress hormone. Uh, or corticosteroids, cortisol, and adrenaline, right? Released from the adrenal glands that sit on top of the kidneys. When somebody's stressed, the flight or flight, think of what happens when you're stressed, right? Bronchodilation, tachypnea, baby's breathing. <sighs> what is that? Fluid. Water. Water vapor, right? So mom calls, says baby's been breathing fast for two days. What's going to happen to the baby? 
dehydrated, insensible fluid loss. Not that you care what that word means, but that's what that is. We have a trivial amount of fluid loss every day from fecal, producing fecal matter, sweating, breathing, right? So a baby who's tachypnic, they're going to have insensible fluid loss, right? So we need to watch out for that. On little preemies, look for the sunken fontanelles. That's a telltale sign, right? Now, because they're stressed, because they're stressed, they've gone into glycolysis. Anybody want to take a shot at what that means? Something with sugar, killing sugar, right? So they've depleted the, the glucose, glycogen in their liver because when you're in a sympathetic response, you need energy, you need sugar, right? So now your liver's depleted from that because you're constantly stressed. Glycolysis, all right? Now, your brain says, I need another form of energy. Let's go tap into the muscles and fat. Glyconeogenesis, big old fancy word for saying, let's get energy from somewhere else, right? So when we go, two-day-old baby who's been tachypnic, lethargic, right? What do we need to check on them? Their sugar. Big time, man. Big time. Treatment of choice? Glucose, right? Glucose. Give them glucose. Check it. Check it often because they're in a sympathetic response. They're, they're using that glucose big time. Right? So it's super, super important to check that sugar on top of your big four, right? To try and get them back. Start a line. Start an IV if they're obtunded, start an IO, right? Um, we give them a fluid challenge. Fluid challenge is 20 mLs per kilogram of an isotonic crystalloid, normal saline, right? So check the glucose, check it often, check it frequently, right? For neonates, you may have to know this, you may have to see this. For neonates, anything less than 45 milligrams per deciliter, you need to treat. And in infants, anything less than 60 milligrams per deciliter, you need to treat. And then fluids, 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 right? There's a resuscitation rate, right? 20 mLs per kilogram. So 45 and less for the tiny ones and 60 and less for the bigger ones, treat it with some sugar. All right, so we have a newborn, a minute old. You just delivered the thing. Something happened. Mom had placenta previa, placenta abruptio. Mom was in an accident, traumatic event, bleeding out. Baby needs fluids, right? How do I cannulate that umbilical cord? Well, first, go under the clamp, cut the clamp, go under it, right? Because if you, the clamp's here and you go to, it's not going to go, right? I have to say that. So we look for the happy face, right? The umbilical cord has two arteries and one vein. And it looks not quite like this, but to give you an exaggerated version, right, of what it looks like, I want to live right here, right? We don't stick a needle in there. We take the needle off the catheter, hook it up to the tubing, put it in the umbilical. I have to say I have to say that, right? And then do our fluid challenge, right? If we were to look at umbilical cord, there's the two eyes, and then the longer one is the vein, and that's where we want to go, right? Uh, give it over a longer period of time. How long, Laura, for fluid resuscitation? No, uh, five to ten minutes. Five to ten minutes, five, not five right ten. away, okay. not right away, right? Um, it could be detrimental to them. So, not, not 30 minutes. Like I was talking about, where's that needle? There it is, right. So. This is a brand new baby, right? Brand new baby. Do I want to stick this big needle in their leg on that soft bone? I would be scared, right? They could have lifelong detrimental effects. That bone, that growth plate could be held liable. You could absolutely be held liable, right? So that's when I would opt to go to umbilical cannulation, right? Because this thing is so tiny that this needle it's kind of big. Oof. I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess this baby up, right? <clears throat> All right, video time. Nice music with it today. So <laughs> that's a baby. That's a baby. <clears throat> He's gonna show you something. Hey, 
the background. I was just going to say, you didn't have music the no, last I two days No, I did not choose that music. <laughs> So this shows the importance of just proper CPR, which this guy doesn't do. For all intent and purposes, that baby is limp, lifeless, and dead. Would you agree? Mom was right there in the end crying. So what's he doing? That's whatever they do in Malaysia. I don't know. Malaysia. Rapid transport, right? They don't know. Right? They don't know. And his... He's probably thinking, we hit him upside down, the water will come out, maybe. Who knows what he's thinking, right? Everybody's freaking out, understandably. Understandably. That's in the new guidelines. <laughs> That's in the new guidelines, along with the alcohol aromatherapy. So let me speed that up because that is, that goes on for a while. Yes, so now I want you to look at that baby. No response, negative affect, no visual tracking, no separation anxiety. That's a three on the Glasgow coma, right? No, I'll just keep going. I'm going to mess it up. So I want you to keep looking at the baby's face, right? So the one guy jumps in, oh, bro, I think they know they do this thing in America where they pump on the chest. Let's try that out. Two hand method, not really appropriate. What just happened to the baby? Gasp. Took a gasp. That baby was D-E-D -E -D dead. The importance of compressions, right? Does it really matter he's doing it improperly with two hands? No, it's working. It's working, right? Mom's right here. Yep. That's another breath. Just from doing CPR, there's another breath. Something's happening. Baby's crying. Baby's crying. Mom is happy as a pig and shit, right? She got her baby back. Baby's back, right? That's how important CPR is. So don't get on scene, think the baby's uh, limp. Yeah, there's no way in this baby back. Do CPR, do ventilation at a minimum, at a minimum, right? Even if you totally freeze out, I don't know what to do with the Braslow tape, right? Pump and blow, pump and blow, because this will happen, okay? Any questions? No? Okay. okay. I'm gonna touch again on some stuff that Fred just went over. With PAL, systematic approach is their big thing. So their big thing is you wanna come in, do your assessment, and then start treating as you assess, okay? So initial impress impression, you're gonna walk in, you wanna look at that appearance, their level of consciousness, look at their breathing, um, the rate of breathing, auscultate lung sounds, and again, check their circulation. You want to just quickly identify life-threatening problems. So initially when you walk in, if you have a child that's unresponsive and not breathing, you are going to go right to life-saving interventions. If not, then we want to continue on with evaluating, identifying, and intervene sequence. So evaluating, we're going to open up the airway, we want to make sure it's clear, maintainable, Breathing, again, we're going to look at their rate, their pattern, their effort. Do we have good air movement, good lung sounds, good oxygen saturation, circulation? We want to look at their heart rate, their rhythm. Where do we check heart rate for pediatric? Brachial. And if you can't get a brachial, femoral, can't get a femoral, what's another thing we can do? Listen. Okay. Don't forget Apical. that one. Hmm? Apical pulse. Apical. Thank you. Uh, skin color, temperature, don't forget temperature, that's a big one to check. Blood pressure, we don't normally go with blood pressures on little ones, it's kind of hard. Pupils, Fred's going to talk a little more about pupils later, okay, but do check their pupils. And blood sugar, that's a big one that a lot of people forget. I think that's one of our like, biggest tools in our box that we probably underuse. And then exposure, uh, again temperature, and then just looking at their skin for either rashes, trauma, things like that. Then you would move on to your sample history and your focus assessment. And then with PALS, they talk a little bit about diagnostic tests. Don't worry about that. I don't think there's any test questions that bring that up, but I'll double check. If you guys want to take pictures of this, 
that's fine. Let's move out of the way. Real quick, what's the age of a newborn? 30 days, 28 days? Zero to one month. Okay, pretty much zero to one month. An infant? Come on, my people with babies, you guys should know this. One month to one year, okay? Toddler? One to three. Good job. Uh, preschooler? How old are the kids when they go to preschool? Three to five. God, man, you guys. <laughs> the other days were spitting them out like they knew, okay. Preschooler is three to five because then you go to kindergarten when you're five, so then you're a school age child and an adolescent. It's your nasty little teenagers, right? So, okay. So these are our heart rates for those. Respiratory rate for the same breakdown. Yeah, some people taking pictures. Dean's like, screw this, I got this all in my head. I know it. You know it? Blood pressure. I also have written on the board here, normal blood pressure for a one-year-old to a 10-year-old. You can do the thing of 90 plus two times their age, okay? For hypotensive, so if they are hypotensive, then their blood pressure would be 70 plus two times their age. So if you have an eight-year-old, what would be a normal blood pressure? Systolic. 106. Yay! Yay! We could do math. Uh, hypotensive for an eight-year-old. Okay. 86. So once we start doing our assessment, then we're going to identify and intervene. So PALS breaks things up into pretty much three categories. You have respiratory issues, cardiac issues, and then, of course, just cardiac arrest. Respiratory. They break it down into four groups. Upper airway. So we already said it. What, what sound are we going to hear with upper airway? Strider. What are some causes of that? Croup? Obstructed airway. Okay. Whether it's a blockage or obstructive because of what? Anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis. is closed. Wait, wait, not, okay. Not. So that's where you're going to hear you're going to have that barking cough with croup, uh, epiglottitis, you're going to have hoarseness, you're going to have that strider sound. So remember, that's all upper airway. Strider. You're going to see that like three times on the test. Okay. Lower airway. So we're going to start thinking more asthma, that wheezing. Okay. Lung tissue disease. They break that down with like pneumonia. So big word, you're going to see it on the test, crackles. If you hear crackles, think lung tissue disease. If you just see crackles as one of the answers, just pick that one. Just pick that one. Lung, lung tissue disease, okay? <laughs> and then pretty much disordered control of breathing is everything else. They just sound, like sum that up into everything else. So, you know, your potential poisonings and overdoses, maybe your trauma patient that has increased ICP, that's going to cause some breathing issues, and that's the category that they give you. Okay? You'll see that one on the test, too. Thank you, guys. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Which one? Disordered control of breathing. You'll see that somewhere. You're, you're going to see it on the test. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe so. Um, now for circulatory identifying, pretty much these are your signs of poor perfusion. So they're going to be breathing fast. They're going to have a weak pulse. Um, their heart rate's going to be up. They're going to be cool skin. Um, decreased level of consciousness. So those are signs of poor perfusion. Here are the things that would cause poor perfusion. You have the hypovolemic or obstructive shock, so pretty much they're running out of fluid, whether it be dehydration okay, or trauma related. Distributive so shock, that's going to be your infections, your septic. So again, either, why, are they, why would they be septic? Some sort of infection that they got, okay. Ear um, infection, throat infection. We're going to get to treatment in just a, a minute. Um, and then cardiogenic shock, heart failure, heart problems. We're not going to probably see that a lot, okay? Especially in our area, like, we are getting an increase in pediatric calls, but we still are much lower than the average. Um, I believe they were telling me yesterday there's one child in Bellaterra, I don't know if Station 4 can reiterate this, um, that has a congenital issue. That's what somebody said they, yeah, that they were running on a well back, but they haven't ran on them. So I don't know if. Yeah. Okay. That's that's what they said. It was a respiratory issue. So normally, 
Normally, if there is a child in a district, the parents are good about contacting and saying, hey, I have a child that has this, this, and this. So um, again, we're lucky that we don't. We're lucky we don't, we don't have one of those, like, when I worked in Collier, there was a, a, a daycare that took special needs patients. And it was right across the street from the hospital, except for it was right across the street from the hospital that took adults, not peds. Like, why wouldn't they put it by the ped hospital? So, all right, we're going to go into management, so pretty much our treatment. So management for respiratory. So again, we're going to break it down. Upper airway. So upper airway, think croup, anaphylaxis. So croup, humidified oxygen, right? And then nebulized epi, okay? What's our dose? Fred normally brings this one up, but I'm going to bring it up. Three. Three what? Three. Right? So three of those, do we have enough? We have two vials we in the drug technically box. Technically, we have two vials in the Pelican box, so you're probably going to have to wait for EMS or screw it. Just do two and it's start. It's going to work. You know? Not as good. You're giving a self-therapeutic dose. Uh, I have used racemic epi before for static asthmaticus, just an asthma attack. You can't break. It works phenomenal. But that heart rate's going to shoot up big time. Yeah. Pete's can handle it. Yeah. So anaphylaxis, we have IM epi, albuterol, steroids, antihistamines. Um, what steroid do we carry? What's our dose? Pete, does anybody know? Two. So that was something that we brought up the first and second day is it changed about a year, yeah, it year and a half ago. One. It used to be one milligram. It's now two. And we used to not be able to give it unless they were 16 or older. Now we can give it if they're two years and older. So two years and older. Two milligrams per kilogram, okay, up to the max. Be very, very cautious of giving something that I am. It is extremely hard on the tissues. They will cry. It's very painful. Even adults, it's Even very adults, painful. It hurts a lot. So. Very hard on the tissues. Try give it IV. Yeah. yeah. Where do we give IM injections on a ped? Go for the thigh. Okay. Tight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it. Think about if you take your kid to the, to the doctor for their vaccines and stuff. Where do they give them? Side side. Okay. They, they don't have enough meat, so go, go with the thighs. Okay. They're going to cry big time. Any shot. It happens. Any shot, they're going to cry. So, um, lower airway, so your, our asthmas and things like that. Again, we're just going to go albuterol. You can do solumedrol, sub Q epi. Lung tissue disease, so our pneumonias. Um, you know, let's just maintain that airway treat that airway, um, but in the end, they're going to need antibiotics, so that's not going to be on us, that's going to be on the hospital. And then disorder control of breathing, um, increase ICP, we just want to make sure that we keep them oxygenated well. Drug of choice, ICP. Bam! Yes! They've all been on it. Yes! I'm liking it. Uh, poisonings overdose, remember, peds get into medicine cabinets. Okay, so control the airway. If it's a narcotic, don't forget, we can give Narcan. So, management of shock. Kind of easy for us. Fluid, 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 fluid. How much fluid? Oh, call. So fluids, 20 milliliters per kilogram bolus. Uh, bolus is like five to 10 minutes. I think I actually have it wrong up there. I think somewhere I have five to 20. So septic, we want fluids. Antibiotics, again, we're not gonna have antibiotics. Cardiogenic shock. So if they're Brady, remember if their heart rate's less than 60, we're gonna start with CPR, airway, um, epi, atropine. For tachycardics, we're always going to start with vagal, right? How do we get a child to vagal? Ice. Ice, okay. What if they're a little older? What else can we try? Straw, blowing in a straw. Okay, scare them. Yeah. All right. It's true. No, it's true. It works. It works. I mean, you're, they're probably going to be scared shitless already, you know? So, okay. Um, and then tachycardia, what are we going to look for for treatment after we try to vagal? What's going to be our next thing? For tachycardias or SVTs. Okay, if they're what? Stable, stable yeah. right? Because if they're unstable, what are we going to go to? Cardioversion. Cardioversion, okay. 
which I hope to God they're somewhat stable because I don't want to be defibrillating a, or cardioverting a pediatric. So, um, and then we can also do amiodarone drips, remember? So, remember, amiodarone, adult pediatric, if they are alive, they get a drip. If they are dead, they get a bolus, okay? Um, I think on the pretest, you guys did see a question pop up as an antidysrhythmic, oh, yeah. as lidocaine. Pal still, still he doesn't use his eyes, that. That. yeah. He don't use that. I don't know any protocol that currently does, but he still calls for it. Yeah. Okay. I was throwing an awful lot of people. Yeah, because I said, oh, when I, when I get to, like, drugs into here just in a second more, I was, I was like, don't worry about lidocaine. It's not on the test. And everybody yelled at me and said it was on the pretest. I was like, I'm sorry. It's not on that test. All right, so... Uh, obstructive shock. So let's think like trauma stuff. So tension pneumothorax, we're going to do needle decompression, cardiac tamponade, we want to do fluids and try to get the blood out, so pericardial synthesis, and pulmonary embolism, again, not much we can do. Treat, you know, try to maintain the airway, you can do fluids. Um, you know, with peds, it's, there's not a lot we really can do, you know. Cardiac arrests, so V-fib, pulses, VTAC. Of course, you're going to go in, CPR, we want to get that airway, whether it's an eye gel or innervation. Um, shocking. So the whole thing of 244, four, right? Two joules per kilogram, then 404. Four. Um, we can actually, you can actually increase, slowly increase each one up to 10, or a max of an adult. So 200, you know. Then we're going to go epi. 0 0.01 milligrams per kilogram, repeat every three to five minutes. Don't get confused with adults that we're doing every five. Peds, you can still do every three to five, okay? Um, and then amiodarone bolus, five milligrams per kilogram. Asystole PEA, they've made this one so easy for everything. CPR, epi, 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 okay? Don't forget H's and T's. I don't, are they still doing H's and T's in class? I feel like, some, like, I feel like they're kind of getting away from it, but I think they're great. So even with adults, think of it. Whether, it's, whether they're in V-fib, asystole, always think of those. Like, what is causing this person to be in this arrest? So. Real, real quick, Laura, go mm -hmm. back. Uh, so for pills, my paramedic students know this, but uh, tricyclic antidepressants, Elevil, uh, Elevil right? uh, drug of choice. Say it. Bicarb. Sodium bicarb, right? Our, if you guys paid attention, at the top of the bicarb, it says 8.4% concentration. We have to dilute that to a pediatric concentration of 4.2%. Same thing we do to get the D50 or D25 out of D50. We discard half of that bicarb and fill half with normal saline, and that gives us now a 4.2% concentration, still the same dose of 1 MEQ per kilograms. Right, and no, not giving half an MEQ is the same as giving it, because concentration and dose are totally different. And somebody was we had arguing, somebody arguing that, like so concentration is one thing, the, your dose is yeah, another. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. So if you're going to get bicarb, just remember for a peds, dispel half and pull half normal saline because we have to half the concentration of it. That's it. Question now. Um, for medications, remember we have the Brazo tape, use it. And then we also have this. This should be in every PD bag on our trucks. Okay, there should be eliminated. We're going to have to update it because Solumedrol is not on it. So we're going to update it and get new ones out. Sorry, we realized that for day for one. Um, Krumfeld made this a few years ago. It's phenomenal. Um, my biggest re thing I like about it is it gives you milligrams and milliliters. Okay, because the problem with the Brazo tape is it just gives you milligrams. Well, mm -hmm. that's great, but now I have to still convert and do math in my head to figure out how many cc's or milliliters. So this tells you, which is or great. Or handy dandy injectors, Laura. Or our handy dandy mm -hmm. dandy injectors. So um, I'll I'll talk about this and then we'll pass it around. So every PD bag should have one of these, right? Has everybody seen this? Oh, good, I got all shakes today. The last two days I've had at least one person go, huh? What is that? So, um, this thing's great. So it comes with a little tape that has the colors on it. Okay, so you can measure or Braslow, either or, doesn't matter. Just get your color. You measure you, from the head to the ankle. You measure from the head to the ankle. Let's Someone say, did it the other way around. Let's say we're here. What color would we pick? Let's say we're right here. 
Purple, go bigger, right? We don't want to under medicate. So if they're right on the cusp, go to the next size up. Okay, we don't want to under, then it's not helping. So this box gives you three epis, um, an atropine, and a lidocaine. Don't worry about the lidocaine. It's in there. That's just how the box comes. Um, unfortunately, they've already been pulled, but Epi, atropine, they also have a nice sticker here. The atropine one's been pulled off, but they mimic the box that the med comes in. Okay, they, they did a really good job. So when you get it, there's also these little baseline stickers. Okay, so you're gonna pull out your med. Let's see. You add the baseline to zero, you're gonna expel, all right? Make sure you bring the plunger to the zero line. You're going to bring the plunger to the zero to, line. You have to. Then, after you measure, let's say the child is yellow, right? I want to look where my baseline is, and I want to make sure my yellow comes down to it, okay, and clicks down here. Don't put the yellow on this sign. You, you need to be able to see that baseline, okay? Um, then you're going to expel until you get the baseline. Hold on. We were playing with this a lot yesterday, so I'm not going to be able to do it. So you want that baseline right at this black baseline here. So the inside, and I'll pass it around. Then you're going yellow. You're going to push up to dose one for your first dose. Second dose, two. Third dose, three. Okay? Um, the reason they give you three in here is because if you get to orange and green, one vial is only going to give you two dosage, so you have to go to a third. Okay? Um, look at it too. Be very careful. Um, whoever's going to push it, make sure they are calm and have steady hands <laughs> because gray is very, very little. You're barely going to push it. You'll see that when I pass this around. Um, so that's great. You don't have to do the math. You don't have to think about it. Okay. Just have somebody, if you get there, have somebody start getting it ready. Okay. Put the sticker on the, on the, on the vial. That's the most important, important thing. thing. You've got to put you that gotta sticker that. On, the, on the vial, the glass port. So you have atropine. Again, I said don't worry about the lidocaine one. Um, technically, these kits are one-time use, but if you can, they're plastic, they can come off. Take them off. Keep them, please. Okay. Uh, it also comes with anaphylaxis epi syringe. So same concept. Draw up whatever color they are. So, and then push. Perfect. All right? A lot less thinking. Real nice, yeah. You don't so, have to do the math anymore. Yeah. Especially, I don't want to do the math, and I don't want to do the math at 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So this is very helpful. It's nice. So, so you have both, I mean, so you have the chart, you have a Brazil tape, you have this. I think, you know, as long as you guys are checking out your trucks and you have all the equipment, you shouldn't have a problem, which is good. Quick refresher, though, just to make sure. So our epi, we're going to use for asystole, PEA, V-fib, bradycardia, our 1 to 10,000, our dose is 0.01 milligrams per kilogram or 0.1 milliliters per kilogram. You can repeat every three to five minutes. Okay. Amiodarone, again, you have your live and your dead because you can either use it for your V-fib or your SVTs. Um, V-fib, dose is the same, but if they're alive, we're going to mix it and do it over a drip. Okay. Still five milligrams per kilogram. Lidocaine, there it is. Yeah. Don't worry about it. It's not on the test. This we don't right use here. it. Atropine, 0.02 milligrams per kilogram. Um, minimum dose is going to be 0.1 milligrams, and your max dose is going to be 0.5. So your dosing should be somewhere between those two for each single dose that you're going to give. Okay. Adenosine, figure out your first dose. So 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, that's going to be your first dose. If you're going to go for a second dose, double it. Okay. Um, should not be a max of adult. Anything should not be the max of an adult. Okay. Or I should say you shouldn't be over the adults. Fluid bolus, 20 milliliters per kilogram. Um, I believe the test says 5 to 15 minutes. Just the test question is not 30 minutes. Okay. Epidrip, let's hope to God we never have to get to an epidrip. But there it is. Or you can, yeah, pull out the dopamine. Clock method. Our respiratory medication, so we have our albuterol for our nebulizer. Benadryl, one milligram per kilogram. IV, IM, again, IM. Okay, if you're going to do IM. 
uh, mag sulfate for our asthmas if you get down to that. Solumedrol, two milligrams, must be two or older. Two or older. It was changed about a year and a half ago. Um, dextrose, pals, they still talk about D25. I know we carry the D10 now. Okay. Glucagon, EMS does carry it, so we should know it. Narcan, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. And then our sodium bicarb, as he already talked about, make sure you dilute the concentration. That's a big one. Our narcotics, so Versed seizures, and, th and these are on the chart. So 0.1 milligrams per kilogram or 0.2 milligrams IM, depending on how you're going to give it. If you're going to give IV, of course it's going to be less. If you're going to go IM or IN, you've got to go a little more. Seizures or severe anxiety, probably not going to see a severe anxiety in a peed, but maybe a teenager. But at that point, they're probably going to be an adult size, and you're going to treat them like an adult. Fentanyl for pain, half a microgram per kilogram. Ketamine for procedural sedation is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. For RSI, still two, two, and two. And that's, I keep forgetting. Um, is that document coming out soon? Thank you. <laughs> it's like the answer for everything now. <laughs> <laughs> the fourth wave of coronavirus. So that has really like paused everything. Um, and then sucks is two milligrams. So remember, your, your rsi is still going to be the two, two, and two. But if you're going to do procedural sedation, you do 0.5. Cardioversion, 0.5 milligrams to one to start, up to two. Do not forget to hit that sync button. Right? Okay. And then if you're in a V-fib and your defibrillation, it's two, four, four, up to 10. I didn't put that up there, but up to 10. Huh? Sure. So if you see the line, yeah, so make sure. Don't go past 10. <laughs> or the max adult. That's it. And then, I mean, again, chances of you seeing a kid in V-fib, I think the, the, the biggest place we would maybe see a kid in V-fib is like a baseball field if they got hit with a ball or something like that. Because normally you're going to be respiratory and they're going to go in asystole, you know? First dose, second dose, third dose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Real quick review, don't forget our ratio. If you're one person, 30 to two. If you're two people, 15 to two for child. We want at least 100 to 120 compressions per minute. That's a test question. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, and of course, if you're alone, you're supposed to start CPR before you call 911 because again, they don't need an AED and drugs. You need to just start moving everything with them. Two minutes worth, so, and then you go. Write this down. Test question. This is important. So post arrest, so when you get ROSC, this is what they say. You should be targeting a temperature of 32 to 36 degrees Celsius for at least 24 hours. So pretty much keep the baby warm. I know somebody asked yesterday, what if you had a child that was like febrile and septic and then went into cardiac arrest? Yeah. Just make sure that they're somewhat maintained and warm. So the next kit I want you to look at when it comes up, it has the, the three things, right? The visual tracking, pos negative or positive affect? Negative. negative affect. Visual tracking? Non-existing. Separation anxiety? No. Nope. Sick baby? Yeah. Yup. Not bueno, right? Next. And this guy following commands, visual tracking, he's interacting with the nurse, sick baby? Probably not, right? Positive or negative affect? Positive affect. Yep, very good. Next. Looks bad. Oh, yeah, that ain't good. Grunting sounds, right? Lethargic, obtunded, right? If the ad, you might look at his fontanelles, tachypnic. What will we expect to see with this baby? What kind of findings? Dehydrated, right? Start a line, big time. Find out what's going on. Check a sugar, absolutely. That's what everybody says, bro. Uh, go to the next, Laura. Yeah, the, where they show the baby right after this. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, okay. The circulation, disability, and exposure components of the primary cell. To assess circulation, you must provide CPR. 
Um, go back just a second. Yep, got that. Well, the assessment of heart rate is very important when evaluating a child's circulation. Alterations in a child's heart rate can provide significant clues to the severity. There's a test question that comes up here in a second. Age and a number of clinical conditions can affect a child's heart rate. When evaluating the heart rate, uh, first consider if it's normal for age, anxiety, pain, agitation. Sick baby, right? But he's crying. He's got that zipper in his chest. They probably just corrected a PDA, patent ductus arteriosum. Test question right here. Pause that real quick. When you see this question, you have a pediatric patient with a heart rate of 60. What should you do with poor perfusion? CPR, ventilate. You'll see that on the test. You should, right? Okay, next please. Another sign of poor perfusion is the capillary refill. Normal capillary refill time is two seconds or less. However, delayed capillary refill time is not always that normal. Other important assessments of perfusion include skin color and temperature. Look to see if the skin is pale or purple. Note if the skin is warm or cool. Look for signs of the skin, nail beds, and the membrane. And compare the color and palpable temperature of the trunk there's one coming up that I need to want to touch on. I think it goes over this. If it's too small, normally high. If it's too big, I'm normally low. It's on the board. For normal blood pressure. One of the scenarios on the test asks, you have an uh, eight-year-old patient with a blood pressure of 106 systolic. Would you consider this to be normal or hypo? Normal. Yeah, we'll just do that. Do an arterial blood pressure. Yeah, it's good. We're getting him on the truck next week, as a matter of fact, as Todd. that real quick all right so he he talks about it briefly but doesn't really go into it. when I assess a child's pupils with a pen light or an adults pupils with a pen light when I shine a pen light in the pupils what's expected constriction right I look at the pupil that I'm shining the light on now I shine the light in that pupil that I'm shining the light on now I assess the other pupil what should that pupil do constrict Right? It's called consensual response. We're not chameleons. We don't have independent control of our uh, uh, pupils. So if you do that, I let, uh, you check the pupil, that one constricts. Now I look at the other one, that one doesn't constrict. Uh-oh. Right? Remember, accidents and falls are the leading cause of death for children. So if they're involved in a head-on MBA, they're in the car seat, mom says, the baby's not acting right. I check the pupils. There's negative consensual response. There's a problem. Right? There's a problem. Okay.
child does not respond to voice, assess the child's response to a painful stimulus, such as a sternal rub. <coughs> Two other quick assessments. A pupil area is a box. Glucose. Glucose. Super important. Exercise and reaction to life. Unequal pupils may suggest a serious problem, such as increased intracranial pressure or high Normally, the pupils rapidly constrict the response to life. In addition, if you shine a light into one eye, the other eye should normally constrict. And this is called consensual constriction. Slow constriction or no constriction may indicate increased intracranial pressure. If one or both pupils are dilated, particularly if they don't have to life, the child may have a severe and life-threatening increase in intracranial pressure and require immediate evaluation and treatment. For any serious fatal child, you should obtain a point of care glucose level concentration as soon as possible. So right, they even harp on it. It's super important to get that sugar level and get it often. It's very important. should have a blood glucose concentration of at least 45 milligrams per deciliter. Infants and older children should have a blood glucose concentration of at least 60 milligrams per deciliter. Next slide. Now, let's move on to the final point of the primary assessment. Not the period, I'm not going to check it. Uh, Lara. In a second. Oh, no, keep going. Okay, pause it. Yeah. All right, so this is also called petechiae rashing, right? This is kind of exaggerated, but if you see these little small ones up there, Right, you'll see that maybe in the chest and the eyelids of a baby who's been uh, uh, had a lot of projectile forceful vomiting. What causes projectile forceful vomiting and petechiae rash on the eyelids? Ow! Ow. Meningitis. Right, there's those are the only two instances where you'll see a petechiae rash is projectile vomiting because they're forcefully vomiting and if anybody's had any, someone with meningitis that stuff flies it flies right so because they're forcing so hard to vomit they actually burst the blood vessels in their eyes and you see it on their face and maybe their chest the only other instance you'll see petechiae rashes when someone's strangled to death those are the only two times you'll see it all right, so be aware that if you come across a baby, a mom says he's been vomiting like crazy, I don't know what's going on, the bright lights are on, and I've had meningitis patients to where just fluorescent lighting just is painful, painful to them, right? Photophobia, that's what it's called. And then you ask, you try to bend the baby and manipulate the baby, and they start crying unconsolably, petechiae rash on the eyelids, you better start thinking meningitis, okay? Keep it going. Let's break to go over the test. All right. Huh? What? Oh, yeah. 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 There we go. So, negatives or positive affect? Negative affect. Visual tracking. He's out. Normally, uh, who's trying to give a baby a breathing treatment? What happens? They ain't taking it. All right, they're not want no part of that. So we know by this kid not purposely moving that mask out of the way, he's tired, lethargic. He doesn't want to deal with it, right? He's breathing super fast. So what's one concern we got to think about? Dehydration, right? Start a line, give him that meds. But this is a sick baby, right? He's got sternal retractions going up top. We got to worry about this kid, right? Mom says he's had a rescue inhaler. I set up an albuterol treatment. Nothing's happening. What's our next step? Receive a cappy, right? Yeah. All right, keep going. Look at that heart rate, right? Fast. SPO2 of 91. He's even breathing that fast.
Look at the next one here. Look at this kid. Is that a sick baby? You, I don't even have to look. I don't. Yeah. Right. Right. Belly, sternal retractions, intercostal retractions, obtunded, negative affect, no visual tracking, no separation anxiety, just a glare, gasping every once in a while. Pucker factor goes up. Right. This is a sick baby. That's a sick baby. Heart rate of 69. What are we on the borderline of doing here? CPR, CPR right? Uh, cause for bradycardia on a child. What's impending? Cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest. Someone's listening. Perfect. Hypoxia, Hypoxia right? Uh, look at that old two sat. 69. Why isn't he on oxygen? Maybe they took it off the. We got to make a video, right? Okay. Yes, sick baby, man. That's a very sick baby. Look at this kid. Belly breathing big time, right? He still has a suckling reflex, but no separation anxiety. He's not crying purposefully. They're doing 12 leads on him, so maybe he has some kind of congenital heart defect. Something's going on. Sick baby, right? Negative affect. Booyah! Look at that heart rate. Fast. Mm-hmm. 